OK, everybody, we're getting ready to go. Um, please take a seat. Um, Paul, just want to let you know your audio is on mute, just if, in case you're not aware. We're having a great day. We have a lot of excellent presentations so far today, and um, but we're really up for a treat at the moment. We have Paul Doughty from the Digit Group, uh, who's an expert in many things. Uh, but including BIM, smart cities, and uh, all sorts of exciting things. So, Paul, you're very welcome to the BIM Coordinator Summit, um, and um, I hand it over to you. Uh, my name is Paul Doherty. Uh, I'll be your keynote now for the next half hour uh, after coming out of lunchtime. Uh, my name uh, is associated with many things, uh, especially early on in the days of CAD and what became a building information modeling. Uh, I'm an architect. Uh, some people call me a recovering architect because I was also a builder. I am also now a real estate developer, and I'm going to give you an approach, at least from one person's perspective, on what this next generation of where we're going with a little bit of background as to where we have been. And I think that type of context could add to the conversation that Ralph and his talented team have put together so far uh, today. And also as we move forward uh, for having those conversations that I think will help redefine what building information modeling can be. So a little bit about what my company does, which is called the Digit Group or TDG. Uh, we deal with lots of innovation. Uh, and what we do is we try and put that into a way for humans to have a different types of type of experience that could be through design. It can be actually due through functional things. So when we take a look at innovations, it's not just about IT. It's not just about, uh, you know, things that you can surveillance people and that type of thing, although that's part of it. What we do is that we take innovations as ingredients to create recipes. And I think that's the most important piece of what you're going to get out of today is that BIM is helping us now as it matures be better chefs, being, be, being able to take a look at data in different ways and being able to mold that into something that is not just a deliverable of a construction document, but can be something else. And that's what, what I'm going to be tr tr trying to explain. How we start to set things up, I think, is important. Because as we start to set up things like pre-design and getting into projects, we're now into the world of setting up principles. In other words, a taxonomy of categories of how we start to work so that we can actually use BIM in a way that we can then leverage its power, which is to be a brokerage or like a router of data for a project. What's also really interesting about BIM and how we're looking at it is that it is an everlasting tool. It is not meant to be just for construction documents that at the end of the contract, it's handed over. So we set up things uh, in our world of, of smart cities, as we've been uh, uh, described in the press, is about principles. And we use things like transportation, infrastructure, energy, water, waste, public safety, security, education, healthcare, green and smart buildings, and of course, citizen services, getting back to the people as hierarchies, meaning horizontal layers that have complexities onto their own. But our job is to weave those things together through what's called an ontology. In other words, vertical hooks that create priorities that are different on every place on the planet Earth. So we just don't do cities from scratch, which we have, and it is an amazing experience, but also going into the world of existing cities and urban environments and how to make them high performance, especially coming out of this world of the of the global pandemic. And what we do is we look back into the world of the UN Sustainable Development Goals as a good benchmark. It is not the end all, but what we can do is actually take some of these of the 17 Sustainable Development Goals, the SDGs as they're called, and start to put those into a storytelling mechanism. What's also been very helpful coming out of the pandemic is that publicly traded companies are not just being uh, measured and rewarded or punished on the stock market for their earnings. It's now about ESGs or the environment, uh, sustainability or social and governance. 
ESGs, along with the Sustainable Development Goals, are probably the best script to come out for the design and construction industry in a very, very long time. Because we're no longer about throwing up a box and calling that architecture or throwing up something that is just meeting a, a, a basic standard. We're, be, we're being held to a higher level. And I really do believe that we are in a very noble type of profession. I love the fact that Ralph and his team have uh, created, uh, you know, things like this that allow us to actually rally around uh, a, an element because we are, I, if you want to say heroes, that's fine, but we do have a noble cause. And that noble cause is based upon the fact that as human beings around the world, we are, we are being hurtled through space on a spaceship called planet Earth. And there are only are certain things that allow our species, the human race to survive. And that is clean air, clean water, a safe and nutritious food supply chain and shelter. So every day that you wake up, understand that you are providing something that is part of the essence of keeping our human species alive, and that is shelter. Based upon the SDGs and the ESGs, along with basic principles, we feel that our real estate developments will be doing something different. This is why this world of resiliency, when you hear that, or smart, or sustainability, or like you know, the, the biggest term out there right now is the flexibility, you know, being able to sustain and scale and adapt to the future, is this idea of net zero. Are we ever going to get to net zero? It's an aspiration, right? But now with BIM, moving beyond this first phase that happened back in uh, the late 90s into the early 2000s, of understanding that we had a different way of expressing our construction documentation, a different way of expressing what we wanted the contractors and the builders to build, is now turning into a tool that can actually be a good measurement. And that's where I'd like to take off for the next 20 minutes or so about where we've been. So I was a consultant back into an organization called Charles River Software in Cambridge, Massachusetts. They came out of a group called Parametric Technologies, also out of Massachusetts, that had purchased a kernel that originally, when I first saw the instance of this, was on the CompuServe forums. And it was about this idea of how do we create a two-dimensional communication package like CAD and turn it into a parametric 3D CAD? And so we were bantering back and forth, a whole bunch of us, and I got my first uh, uh, usage of this thing, and boy, did it suck. It was awful, but the idea was very cool. So I, I became a consultant in uh, with the management team uh, that was led by a brand new CEO that came in called Dave Lamont. Uh, and I had barely actually worked with the tech team led by uh, Leonette and Irwin. Uh, and we changed our name and brand to Revit. And my job was to get it into my friends' architectural firms. Uh, so I pleaded, I begged, and you know, did everything I could in order to get one or two seats into these large-scale organizations, group like NBBJ, uh, groups like HOK and others, just to try it out and then give me some user feedback. So what you're taking a look at here is actually this. Yeah the original code of Revit, the release 1.01. Uh, probably not the first, first, first one, but it's the one that I can actually find. And what we found with Revit was that we were able to do things that we normally could not do in CAD. So it kind of automated things, like being able to change something in one instance and make sure that when you actually printed out your construction documentation, it was all changed down the line. That saved a lot of time. So we got some traction and we had about $800,000 worth of revenue uh, when we were positioning ourselves to be acquired by Autodesk. And when we did that, uh, there was a very disciplined way of how to do that. And that was to scare Car Carol Bartz that her decision to take Softdesk and call it architectural desktop was the wrong move. And we did it. 
Now, we actually got a lot of background, uh, sorry, a, a little bit more background, but I think it's important is that Autodesk came and lowballed us originally. There was also another organization uh, led by a board member called Errol Walford that actually then also put in a bid. He recused himself from the board because he thought, wouldn't it be really cool to give Revit out to free to all professionals and have building product manufacturers in the world of families actually be the ones that pay for the software? It would have been brilliant. I think it would have changed trajectory. But what happened was Autodesk came back and bought us for $133 million. That was a very good day. Subsequently, the way that we were positioning this and the way that I was selling it into these large architectural firms was that this was being made for a professional that did not exist yet. And that professional, as we're getting to know them now, are virtual design and construction professionals. These are the people that should understand how a building goes together in the real world so that we can create, now here's a piece of word salad, a digital twin of what's happening in reality, right? So that person didn't exist, but Autodesk and its and its customers were designers. So it was pushed as a design tool when it was never intended for that. It could have been, but those design professionals did not exist. So I have to apologize. We've been pushing a boulder up the hill for almost 20 years based on a technology that was meant for people that did not exist, but now they do. So right now we kind of find ourselves in a very funky position because we are now in uh, the world uh, well, of Squid Game. We're kind of like number one, you know, staring off into the, you know, into the abyss, trying to understand and finding a community like the AEC Hive, like this BIM Coordinator Summit, where we can actually look at each other and go, hey, wait a second, you're going through those same pains that we are. Let's get together and try and solve them. What I'd like to do now is to say that to actually win the squid game of BIM, I think we need to start to reassess and reimagine what this tool can do. The Economist last week put out this wonderful term, and I, I, I just think that it captures the essence of where we're at right now at a global scale. We're in the shortage economy. We have a shortage of talent. We have a shortage of materials, especially supply chain. Anyone that is uh, dealing with the field right now, last week here in the US, it was roofing products went crazy. This week it's glass. Next week, who knows? We're into this world now where we need some certainty. And some of that certainty we believe is gonna revolve around the internet of materials. So hear me out on this. Right now, the EU did a study that said that the majority of waste, 60% according to their reports, of waste that is inhibiting getting to a net zero carbon world is all on the construction industry. And they're giving us two years before they start to enact laws to start to take care of things if we can't take care of ourselves. So one thing that BIM brings to the table is that we do have the ability to take individual components, be it furniture, fixtures, equipment, uh, raw materials, whatever they are, and we identify them, and then we pull them together into what we call a virtual building. So that what? Then we can then actually push that out to the field and build the actual structure itself. Another big piece of what I'm thinking is a huge, huge growth market is our existing inventory of buildings and trying to understand what are they. So groups that are putting out things like LIDAR and reality capture and all that stuff, it may seem like that's a nice to have, but I'm here to say today it's a must have because when the EU is saying, we're going to punish you as a construction industry unless you start getting your act together, you better know what's inside of existing buildings and how you manage the construction of new buildings because we create so much waste on the existing site that we need to get a better handle of it. By using BIM as that benchmark, as that tool that can create empirical data, when you start to attach 
decentralized ledger technology into BIM. Yes, I'm talking blockchain. We now have the ability to start the process of creating solutions. The idea of the Internet of Materials is that we have this ability now to, to look at life cycle and really do it. Because if we don't start getting into how much waste we create during new construction and ultimately the demolition of our existing built environment, we're going to be into a treadmill that we never get out of and we will then be punished specifically by the EU in the next two years if we do not get a handle around this. So uh, I will make this uh, uh, PowerPoint available to everyone so that you can take a look at these graphs and understand the magnitude of what we're up against. Because if we don't do it, we're going to have politicians get involved with the construction industry, sort of like the nanny state coming in and telling us how to work. So this is another element of BIM, and it actually uh, you know, goes around this idea of, of blockchain. <clears throat> and we, I'm going to specifically talk about the U.S. market, where the American Institute of Architects, starting next year, as early as second quarter 2022, is going to be doing away and rolling out the PDF documents, which they say is, you know, their 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 digital, uh, you know, world. So right now, PDF templates are how you are making sure that you, uh, you know, transact in a contractual way. Um, recently, the American Institute of Architects sold their construction documents division, and Chris Anderson, uh, the venture capitalist that came in has a vision now of rolling into an Ethereum-based blockchain smart contract world. This changes a lot of things because now all of a sudden BIM becomes a design and management decision tool, not just how to build the building. Because right now, to get away with a lot of contracts, I'm watching a lot of BIM wash. Things look really good in Revit, but as they start to push out 2D documents, which is mind blowing, right? Like, why aren't you building for the model? But that's another whole, you know, three day conference about the ineptitude of why we do BIM in order to create 2D documents. Why don't they, the majority of you should just use AutoCAD. You were better at it because you suck at BIM, but that's another whole story. But let's just stick with the positive, you know, element of this, that BIM can be built when you put it into a smart contract, there's immutable data now that does transactions from a parent-child type of way of making decisions, <clears throat> meaning that the blockchain becomes an amazing tool to put discipline into the building information model. So for those of you that don't know how to build a building physically, and you think that BIM is just a tool to provide design intent, uh, get out of the way. Because the people now, the VDC people that know how to build buildings and can actually put this stuff into place, go right to this second line. The second line uh, gra graphic is to say that with all of our projects, when we put out our general conditions, all the building product manufacturers are required to put either a barcode or a QR code at the least onto every element that comes onto our site. This can be as sophisticated as an RFID, or it can be as uh, simple, as I said before, like a QR code. This means that when the subcontractor puts, puts material in place, it will then talk to the building information model that in real time is building your as-built or record documents. This is huge because a lot of GCs at the end of the day go back to the subcontractors in order to get paid to say, what did you do? And we get a lot of misinformation that's put in as an as-built drawing that we hand off to an owner and the facility manager is going, what is this? So we now have that step starting to actually put into alignment that allows us now to create this flow of work in place. It looks at the contract document, BIM. It says it's in place. It goes through the smart contract, through the blockchain, Everything checks out and an automatic payment is played is placed. Now, this means <clears throat> that groups like Open 
Space and StructureCon and all these wonderful new startups that have the idea of let's take you know cameras and lidar and put them onto uh, you know hard hats onto the field. They become a very very important tool because now they become the quality factor of yes this was put in place geospatially, but was it put in place according to the contract in a quality manner? Now all of a sudden. 24 hour payments to subcontractors are a reality. This means <clears throat> that we also need to look at blockchain as a means of creating a decentralized autonomous organization or DAO that one company could not hold all of this amazing authenticated and trusted data. It's got to be a autonomous way of looking at this made up of industry industry associations, AEC companies, building product manufacturers, NGOs and government institutions. This is being built. ConstructureDataAssurance.com is real, and this will provide everyone that uses contracts like the AIA contracts, not exclusive, to have access to this data in a aggregated way for analysis reports, repeatable reporting, benchmarks, and goodness knows what else. How about ESG reports, performance of your materials for feedback to those building product manufacturers? It's endless, and it all is coordinated through BIM. This is what I you know, term BIM 2.0 or the next generation, that BIM is no longer how you construct a building. It's also the performance of how it's put in place, and most importantly, how it's performing over a life cycle. This means we're starting to get into the conversation with people that are concerned about things like carbon neutrality and starting to see that the industry is making attempts to do great things. Now, so what we're seeing as this next level, this next generation of BIM, is this mixed reality of having the digital asset and the physical asset interact. Some people call that the digital twin. We like to see it because we put our digital twins onto gaming engines, that the gaming engines, when you federate them together, in other words, have them communicate together, actually create what's been coined by NVIDIA, an omniverse, a way of interconnecting the digital worlds for experiences, for transactions, and in certain cases, to have things work together for security, for safety. In certain cases, energy, water, waste, transportation, our worlds of education, healthcare, trying to get to net zero carbon. And finally, into the world of transactions, we're finding through our approach and through our proofs of concepts that this is a very powerful metaphor, a very powerful new, new wave, uh, a, a brave new world, if you will, that we are finding new ways of expressing how the human condition could be improved. And the case of that would be what we're doing with NEOM. And with NEOM, what we're finding is that we were asked to provide a proposal for their healthcare system. The healthcare system, what we decided to put as one of the pieces of a horizontal system to make up an ecosystem called a heterarchy. That way we could then start to take the needs of the customer that wanted to have a hub and spoke model now, in traditional construction, which BIM represents, that would mean a general hospital with a lot of different clinics around it. What we're finding was that that was probably the wrong approach because of the demand model. We're not sure exactly how many people are going to be in NEOM at any one time. And one thing you don't want to do is overbuild or underbuild. So how do you create an environment that allows the needs to drive what the capital assets are going to uh, provide? And the way that we went about that was to say that the customer, or, or, the, or in this case, in the patient in NEOM is the hub, not the general hospital, and that there are multitudes of medical services that surround that person, that money should be spent, and the majority of the money would be spent, on healthy people, which means that we're talking about a wellness type of environment, a wellness type of community, where people are informed through their own version of a metaverse, through things like Fitbits and all sorts of technologies that can be embedded within our built environment, uh, well, you know, walls, floors, and ceilings of every type of facility. When we did that, it's, it, it then alleviated the need to build out 
in the traditional way, a true hub and spoke model, although that will be built and focus in on the digital side of things, that digital twin of a person. Now that provides a really interesting roadmap for us in our industry about our use of BIM in the future, because BIM is not just about the constructability and in the case of NEOM and in the case of other projects that you will see, including our Kingdom Tower project in Kingdom City in Jeddah, or the Jericho Center for Medical Diplomacy, where, again, we don't know what the actual drive is going to be from the needs aspect, but we do know that there's going to be a certain amount that are going to be needed over time as NEOM starts to populate, as the Jetta Economic City starts to populate. In the case of the Jericho Center, how many people in this oasis for breast cancer survivors are going to be needed over time? Which is why we went to a design for manufacturing and assembly model, DFMA, based upon components of modular construction. Meaning that instead of creating a building and then tearing it down, which we're very good at and very wasteful, which adds to our carbon footprint, what would happen if we were able then to create these components that are reusable and expandable based upon a patient's journey and their need to come to a healing oasis like this in Jericho that allows them to, to be a resident from anywhere from six to 12 to 24 weeks? And how do we create that as an environment, not as a hotel room where, you know, you're just one of many, but actually has the dignity and also the opportunity to actually meet other cancer survivors and form that community just by creating those environments of courtyards, of the happen chance collisions between people and cultures. And probably most importantly, in this case, the way that we designed this was around food, the great fusion of bringing people together. So as, and then one final thing that I want to say about BIM, uh, moving on beyond just being a contractual construction document that is necessary for the procurement and the delivery of a capital asset, that it has a life beyond that. You know, we had talked earlier about this idea of the, inter the internet of materials, being able to take an NFT of every single piece of a component, every component of a of a building and being, being able to put it into a contractual type of relationship where a smart contract now can track its overall performance. That's very cool. I wanna take that one step further with the work that we're doing right now in Qingdao, China with our build out of the International Virtual Reality Theme Park. This becomes a really big deal because we are now creating, of course, our building information models as construction documentation for the contractors to build each one of these rides, each one of these experiences inside this theme park to spec. Okay. Then what we do is we then take that, put it into uh, a technology that we call VIM. Uh, and from VIM, we're able to place it into any type of, of gaming engine that we want. In this case, we prefer the Unreal Engine just for a multitude of business reasons. By having it on the Unreal Engine and then being able to federate every one of these buildings that you see, what we're able to do is we're able to open up as a functional business virtually two years before these buildings come up out of the ground and are finished. Let me say that again. We're able to open up and conduct transactions using tech, tech technologies and games and experiences like from Tencent, like League of Legends and others that are allowing us then to have the virtual representation of people visiting our theme park before it's built. This cuts down our construction loan on the average of 18%. That is enormous when you're talking about a $1.2 billion facility. So this is the way that we're looking at BIM. We're seeing it as a way of, of showing a path forward in the future that is just being discovered, which is this idea of digital real estate and physical real estate, having this umbilical cord type of relationship in ways that we are now just discovering. We also have this idea that for every footprint, there is a cloud print, meaning that whenever you're doing something physically, always understand that BIM becomes the great tool, the great communication tool that allows us to create that next generational experience. So as you're thinking through what uh, we've been uh, describing during this keynote as, well, how does that actually impact me? Maybe there's one thing that I can leave you with that I feel very strongly about. And that is we are on a spaceship earth. We're hurtling through space to a destination that we don't know. We are using our environment 
some good in a lot of ways bad, which is why there's a lot of talk about ESGs and carbon footprints and climate change and all these things. But really at the end of the day, it's never about saving the earth. The earth's gonna be fine. Even if it's a bowl of dust hurtling through space, it doesn't care. What, what we care about as the human species is four things. We wanna make sure that the earth is providing us an environment that has clean air, that has fresh water, that has a food supply chain that is safe, and most importantly, shelter. If we have those four things, the human race is going to survive. What we're looking to do in the built environment is to reimagine ourselves so that shelter is something that we thrive, not just survive. And if we can start to take a look at BIM as being one of those enabling elements, well, then we have a noble cause as an industry. From the sole practitioner architect all the way through the individual self-employed plumber anywhere on planet earth and everyone in between including the fortune 500 companies that are that are our building product manufacturers that supply our materials or our, our ff and e and everything else involved in the built environment we all have a hand in this so i would be very very pleased if you could think of yourselves not just as heroes but as digital warriors that we have ralph and the arc, arc docs folks to thank for providing this forum for us to start to explore these conversations, that we do have a noble cause of providing shelter for the human race, and you should hold your heads up high. On behalf of TDG, the people that are creating the city that is redefined, my name is Paul Doherty. Thank you.